Bibles this evening to Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 19. I've uh, starting a series uh, looking at Jeremiah and Lamentations, and uh, there's some material uh, using uh, Tears for Shattered Lives. As you look at Jeremiah, there really is, uh, obviously we're not quite as far advanced here in this nation, but as we look at our country and we look at what is transpiring, uh, there is cause for uh, distress. And tonight, at prophet and perilous times, a difficult times call for dedicated people. Here in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 19, this will be the verse, and tonight is really more of an overview of the book of Jeremiah and looking at Lamentations. Um, but as we look at this, you're going to find a prophet uh, who is addressing a nation, the nation of Judah, that is going through and is being overrun by the enemy. And his heart is broken because those of his own country, his countrymen, are going to face a judgment and a chastisement and a destruction that they have never seen before. There are things that we see as parallels here to this day. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 19. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said, truly, this is a grief and I must bear it. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your goodness and your grace. And Father, I pray that you would help me as I preach your word tonight. Lord, I, I need your guidance. I need your direction. I need your thoughts. And Father, I commit this time in your hands. Lord, I just pray that as we see what's going on all around us, Father, that in our hearts and lives, that we would just lean upon thee, Lord, that we could be strong when things around us seem to be going the opposite direction. And so, Lord Jesus, I, I love you. I pray, Father, that if anyone watching or here, a Father that does not know you, as their personal Savior, that tonight would be the night of salvation. And for those of us as Christians, Lord, I pray that we would find a hope as we look at those who've gone before us that have stayed faithful in some very trying days. Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. God's Word really does deal with every aspect of our life. And in the Bible, we find words of wisdom and joy visions of future glory. Also find uh, passages of scripture that deal with incredible pain and grief and a failure to common to all of us. Jeremiah and Lamentations really are some less familiar books that we would not necessarily normally look at. Uh, but in these hard times, these books really describe the final years of Judah uh, before her destruction and she would be taken away into Babylon. And after years of arrogant wickedness, God's inevitable judgment was coming upon Judah. It really is going to be kind of like a desert storm from the north, and Babylonian army is going to sweep in. They're going to invade, and they're going to destroy cities and uh, plunder treasures and take people back to their own home country. They're going to ravage it. It is under these really uh, circumstances, appalling circumstances, that God raises up Jeremiah uh, to give out the truth. Jeremiah's ministry was strenuous. It was unrewarding. And not only that, he was rejected. Many times as you look through the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is going to cry out in absolute frustration and irritation of the failure because the Judean people will not listen. But the Lord would reassure Jeremiah that even in these hard times, I'm still with you. Jeremiah do strengthen the Lord and remain faithful to his task despite overwhelming odds. A feeling, indescribable feelings of self-doubt, of uh, I can't do it. You think about Lamentations, which is Jeremiah's writings a little bit further, and his song of mourning of Jerusalem's destruction. He wept as he watched his nation plunged into ruin. From, Judah, from, from really, from Jeremiah's perspective, it is a very depressing situation. There, nevertheless, Jeremiah would cling to the faithfulness of God, and he found a confidence in God in this time. Let me give you an illustration. When a young man showed up at his new job as a painter, he soon realized that the job was going to be challenging. 
The first day, he had to climb up four stories worth of scaffolding to reach the eaves of the building he was supposed to paint. When he got to the top, he froze. The scaffolding swayed a little and seemed like it could topple at any moment. Everything with him, within him was telling him to climb back down and quit the job, but he stayed. Eventually, the painting so high in the air became easy. Near the end of the summer, the young man climbed up the scaffolding once again and noticed a couple bumblebees flying around the eaves. He then watched them fly into a <coughs> portion of, the, uh, of their nest that was nestled under the Spanish tiles that made up the roof. Again, the painter froze. He wanted to quit more than ever. He hated flying insects that sting, but like before, he persevered. He just did the scraping and the painting gingerly with his eyes wide open and a clear path to the edge of the scaffolding, and he finished his job. Have you ever felt like this man, that maybe your job is too difficult? Have you ever, how do you respond in this difficulty as you think about this? Jeremiah has an impossible task. And the lesson today with Jeremiah is a prophet who lived in dangerous times. But it teaches us how believers can be dedicated to God and keep standing during difficult times. And the principle tonight is stand strong in the Lord in difficult times. Let's look at several things about the prophet. Would you turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 1, uh, verses 4 through 10. Jeremiah chapter 1, uh, verses 4 through 10. Before Jeremiah was even born, the God had a plan for his life. And as we look at our lives, and as we look at what we're going through, As long as we're not, we know that we're not out of the will of God, then what we're doing is what God wants us to be doing. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. Whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set thee this day. I, I had this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. God had an early calling on Jeremiah's life, and Jeremiah's call, his career was very long, probably over 40 years. And during that time, he would preach to the nation of Judah, and they never listened to him. And only that, he knew that his people would go into captivity, and he's preaching a message that very well could have potentially saved them from the harsh conditions that they would find themselves in. He would be taken to Egypt as a captive. Look, through all this time, though, in Jeremiah 16, Jeremiah, as you and I have friends and some of you may be married, in Jeremiah chapter 16, I want you to notice with me that the loneliness that Jeremiah would have, he was not allowed by God the privilege of a wife. In Jeremiah 16, 1, then the word, the word of the Lord came also to me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. For thus saith the Lord concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning their mothers that bear them, and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. They shall die of grievous death, they shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. Jeremiah, I want you to prophesy all alone. Long, lonely job. Who would have cared in Judah if, J if Jeremiah would have quit? If you think about the job of Jeremiah, who would have cared had he quit? No one. They would have been like, finally, he be, he's quiet. Finally, he's out of here. What does the fact reveal about Jeremiah to keep going? Why would Jeremiah keep going? The only thing that would keep him going, as we saw in Jeremiah chapter 1, and as you'll see in other places of Scripture, was that he knew his calling was of God for a specific task. And when there's times in our lives and we want to quit, we want to give up, we want to leave, we want to do something else, and we're saying, God, it is too much. God, I can't do it. We need to know what God's calling is on our life. 
You might be saying, well, I'm working at this particular job, or uh, I'm doing this, or I'm doing this. Whatever your task is, if you know that's what God wants you to do, we need to keep pushing forward in the strength of Almighty God. And Jeremiah displayed a tremendous amount of compassion and courage. We find many details about himself and what he was like and what he felt in his struggles. Look with me at Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. Look with me, I want to show you Jeremiah's deep, deep, deep sorrow. I mean, Jeremiah went to the depths of depression. He's seeing his nation, his people, destroyed by an invading nation. Jeremiah 9, 1, Oh, that my head were, head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah is heartbroken over the state of his people, over the state of his nation. And he's heartbroken. I mean, he is literally grieved to his core over the judgment and slaughter they're going to be subjected to. And he wishes that he could continue to cry and cry and cry for the state of his people. He loves them. He knows that their wickedness has brought this great calamity upon them. Look with me at verses 2 and 3. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go for them. That they be all adulterers and assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongues like their bows for li- their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. But they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Jeremiah says, "God, I want to get alone. I'm sick. What's happening to my nation?" As we look at what is happening here in Canada and around the world, as we look at the devastation, the suicides, the businesses ruined, the utter despair, the nation, the politics that are going in a direction uh, in many different ways with which different from what we're used to, and it ought to grieve us. But it ought to grieve us more so because we know of the position where people are headed when this life is over. Why is compassion so necessary to ministry, not just for the pastor? Why is it for any person that is a member of a local New Testament church, you have a ministry? Why is compassion necessary? Because without compassion, your ministry becomes just a job. Without compassion, the issues of the people at hand become insurmountable and they're not worth the effort. Without compassion, people become just a, a, without just a habit, a hobby, just a number. People become the problem rather than the source of service. And Jeremiah would feel things deeply. And so his message of judgment on Judah brought him a great deal of pain. As we look here, oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears. He was sensitive to the people and their hurts. His stern message did not uh, make him a rigid, uncaring person, but throughout his long ministry, he doesn't say, what an idiot. I mean, my nation is a bunch of idiots. They're a bunch of fools. They're headed for destruction. Ha, good on them. I'm not bringing them God's message. Jeremiah displays, these are my people. Lord, I need to, God, please. I know they deserve it. But God, they're my people. Jeremiah was a man of great courage. And as the Lord's prophet, Jeremiah would face countless challenges. His ministry required him to come face to face with priests, false court prophets, those who were the idolatrous prophets, and even the king. He had to reprove them for their sins. That pressure would overwhelm most people. Jeremiah showed courage in spite of obstacles. Knowing that God had commissioned him and knowing what God wanted him to do, what God had wanted him to say, he says, I'm going to keep on with the challenge. God, you called me before I was even born. You know what our jobs, whether you're working secular or sacred job, Your ministry is to do what God has called you to do 
and to keep that compassionate, tender heart for the people you're around. Jeremiah had a tough hide. I mean, for him to have the tenacity to continue to say, you need to repent. Don't go to Egypt. Don't go to Egypt. Don't go to Egypt. And yet they still go and they throw him in, a, they throw him in the dungeon. He did not shrink back. The message was clear. Jeremiah was given God's message, and he proclaimed it. Look with me at Jeremiah chapter 1. As I looked over this passage and studied this material, it greatly encouraged my heart. There are days that are very, there are days that, uh, just things that, loneliness and other things, and you're like, God, it's too much. I can't handle it, Lord. As I thought about Jeremiah, it challenged my heart. Look with me, verse 17. Thou, therefore, gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the king of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. What did God tell Jeremiah to do as he prepared for ministry? He was to speak God's commands. He was to speak to a rebellious people. He was to speak a prophecy while Israel is in a decent time. They're under Josiah, who was a good king. And after Josiah passes off the scene, I'm going to talk about him here shortly. But after Josiah, who was a good and godly king, passes off the scene, you better watch out. Jeremiah had many, many battles with those with whom he ministered, both within and without. And he has to speak against the kings of Judah, the princes, the priests, and the people. And his courage, look at me at verse 18. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, an iron pillar, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the king of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. God says, I made you a defense, impenetrable fortress. Jeremiah, I'm with you. Jeremiah, I'm going to strengthen you. Jeremiah, you may think you cannot do it. But I want to tell you something, Jeremiah. I'm with you. Jeremiah would say, going back to Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 19, he's distressed, but he's honest. Verse 19, woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said, truly, this is a grief and I must bear it. Verse Chapter 11, verse 19. But I was like a lamb. Verse 19 of chapter 11. But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter and I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut, cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. The very people that God has called him to minister to want to kill him. He struggled with his own emotional reactions to the rejection and the distress he faced. He's standing in the middle between the Lord and the holy nation, and there is Jeremiah. It's kind of like, don't shoot the messenger. They wanted to shoot the messenger. And Jeremiah would face opposition both from within and without. I mean, Jeremiah was a man of the country, of the nation that was not liked. And yet he pleads for mercy on his people. In spite of his prayers, they don't understand his heart, his care. And Jeremiah would accept the pain, the great pain that he was rejected Because he was God's prophet. What happens to our lives and our ministry if we make pleasing people more important than pleasing God? In Jeremiah's condition, I just, it's too much. I can't handle it, God. The people are against me. God, they won't listen. How how many times do I have to beat them against a wall? They won't listen. You know what will happen? We'll get sorely stressed out. We'll feel dejected and hurt. We may even get bitter, but we forfeit God's protection. We fail to give out God's word as he commanded, and we'll cease living by faith. When I live for the pleasures and and the compliments of humanity, 
then and then what I'm going to do is when a whole bunch of when I'm getting a whole bunch of somebody against me, it doesn't matter their position, but I get someone that's always against me. It's going to weary you. And if I do not know my calling, I do not know what God wants me to do, I will give up. Jeremiah was amazingly honest in expressing what was going on in his life. And I appreciate Jeremiah. He's known as the weeping prophet. (laughs) I mean, you want to talk about a big old crybaby, that would be Jeremiah. But it wasn't because he was weak. And he would utter doubts. He would question God. He, he would qu- The pains that he was going through, he would express to God, and you get to see the heart of Jeremiah in this book. Look with me at chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Chapter 12, verse 1. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore all they that happy that deal very treacherously thou hast planted them yea they have taken root they grow yea they bring forth fruit thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins but thou O lord knowest me thou hast seen me and tried mine heart toward thee pull them out like sheep for the, the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter how long shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither For the wickedness of them that dwell there, and the beasts are consumed, and the birds, because they said, he shall not see our last end. Jeremiah is like, Lord, how long is this going to go? Lord, why? But Jeremiah kept living for God, and he proved the validity of his calling no matter what. No matter who's against me. Kind of like on Sunday night when uh, we had uh, Pastor Surratt, we watched that video, and he said, with Athanasius, and they had the Arian controversy, which the Arians today are the Jehovah's Witness, uh, still uh, lowering the deity of Christ and, and um, <laughs> going on. But anyways, Athanasius, they said, what if the world's against you? And then he said, if Athanasius is against the world. I'm going to stand on the principle of what God wants me to do, and you will not move me. That's where we need to be. He performed his ministry with excellence, and he proved the validity of his calling. It was God that called me. He didn't manufacture a message from God that would lower it and make it nice and soft for everyone. No, he said, thus saith the Lord. You know what he could have done to be more acceptable? I mean, he could have downplayed. He could have not given out the fact. He could have said, oh, God loves you, Judah, and God's caring, and oh, what a wonderful God we have, and he is. But God also judges sin. He repeated what God gave him. But he could have simply said, ah, I don't need to say all of the words that God gave me. He could have spoken of God's displeasure, but not spoken of the absolute impending judgment that was to come upon them. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll come back to Jeremiah, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Jeremiah was probably one of my more favorite books. I, I like the transparency of him. I like all the Bible, but some of those that I tend to gravitate more, I do appreciate Jeremiah in the, New, in the Old Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, uh, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Here is the preacher's, what, obviously 2 Timothy is written to Timothy. It's a pastoral epistle. You have 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus are pastoral epistles. And in this, obviously, he's saying, stand firm. Do what you've been called to do. Now, why would many preachers uh, want to waver? Why would they want to lessen what God has said? Well, I mean, obviously, it's not all that's said in here is always the most uh, enjoyable. But we need to be reproved. We need to be rebuked. We need to be exhorted. We need to be encouraged. We need to be challenged. But we also need to impart doctrine. And we also be able to respond to questions from various parties. And the very nation that Jeremiah was prophesying in, uh, his ministry would last approximately from 627 B.C. to 582 B.C. 
And Jer- he saw Judah go from a place of, uh, they seemed like everything was okay. I mean, they had the riches, they had the wealth, they had the blessings of God. But wickedness was abounding. And as all of that comfort of life was there, God finally said, enough is enough. And Judah was fading spiritually and morally and politically. And he preached to a nation that was on its way to defeat and disaster. As Jer- Jeremiah's ministry really began around the middle of the reign of Josiah. If you want to look at more about Josiah, look with me at 2 Kings 22. We're not going to look there. I'll abbreviate for the sake of time this evening. But Jeremiah, or excuse me, 2 Kings chapter 22, Josiah was a godly king. It says in actually 2 Kings 22 too, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. He desired to rebuild the temple. He, Josiah, in 2 Kings 22, 13, he says, Go inquire for the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of the book. They found the book of the law, the book of the covenant in the temple, and they said, What am I supposed to do with this? 2 Kings twenty two sixteen. 16, they go to Holder, the prophetess there, uh, in, who was a wardrobe keeper there at the college in Jerusalem, and they ask her, and She's talking about God bringing judgment, 2 Kings twenty two sixteen, She says judgment's coming upon Judah. What does Josiah do? 2 Kings twenty two nineteen 19 and 20. His heart was tender and he, he was broken. He humbled himself and in desolation he rent his clothes and he wept over his people and he got right with God and, oh God, make it right. And as a result of that, God would spare Josiah until after Josiah had died, des- desolation and destruction would come after, Jeremiah, after Josiah's reign. I mean, the people read all the words of the book, and they read in all their ears, and they listened to the words, and there was true repentance. I mean, Josiah would end up going through, he killed all the idolatrous priests, he burned down any image or groves, he destroyed the house of the Sodomites, he destroyed the houses given to the sun god, his only heir was to not remove the false altar at Bethel, which was where Jeremiah used uh, used to cause Israel to go astray. He slew all the idolatrous priests. I mean, Josiah was a king that was godly from 640 to 609. And God used him to bring a reformation to the nation because they found the book of the law. The Bible was found and the people got right. Josiah made a valiant effort to return Judah back to God. However, at the age of 39, he was killed when he tried to oppose Pharaoh of Egypt. And after his death, (laughs) there was a whole bunch of kings. There was a lot of devastation. And what happens? Babylon comes knocking. So in 605 B.C., Jehoiakim becomes a vassal. He becomes an underling of Nebuchadnezzar through this. But he decides to rebel in 601, four years later. And he is put aside. Jehoiakim died during the siege, and his son Jehoiakim took over. He only reigned for three months until he surrendered to Babylon. And then Nebuchadnezzar took the king, the soldiers, the wealthy people, and the skilled artisans, and he plundered the royal treasures of Judah. Who did he leave there? Only the poorest people. He ruled over a remnant. So what happened is Nebuchadnezzar took a third son, Josiah. A third son of Josiah, Mattaniah, excuse me. His name was changed to Zedekiah. He didn't like the name Mattaniah, so he changed his name to Zedekiah. And many of Jeremiah's prophecies occurred during Zedekiah's reign. He proved for the spiritual leadership of Judah that he was very weak and foolish. He kind of just went along with whatever the Nebuchadnezzar wanted him to do. His heart was wicked. He was foolish. He loved pleasing the government and the kings more than pleasing God. He only looked at himself. Uh, He really had foolish thoughts. He had evil judgments on others. And when Zedekiah rebelled against Babylon in 589, uh, Nebuchadnezzar returned to Jerusalem for a third and final time. He said, I'm done. I'm done with these kings. After a brutal siege that drove the city into starvation, uh, Nebuchadnezzar breached the walls, burned the city and the temple. And nearly all of the remaining people he brought into captivity. When Zedekiah tried to leave, he actually, uh, he was blinded. They cut out his eyes. He was taken a prisoner. The royal line of David was finished 
up until Christ. Nebuchadnezzar appointed Gedaliah to serve as a governor, and after just a few months, Gedaliah was assassinated. People feared the Babylonians would return, and so they fled to Egypt. And it's during this time, in Jeremiah chapters 40 to 44, they flee Babylon into Egypt, and Jeremiah is saying, don't flee, it'll be okay. But all of this chaos and political upheaval and everything that's going on, Jeremiah has to prophesy. Is it simple? No. But Jeremiah had the fortitude in a distressing time. Can anyone really ever rightly say that his or her job or your ministry situation is just too difficult? No. There's no ministry that really is too difficult when the Lord calls you to that work. And so the book of Jeremiah really is a collection of what Jeremiah did and what he said and what he felt. Look with me at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10, going back to our uh, main main book here, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. There's several several illustrations that are given here uh, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10, just looking at, again, an overview of this. You find two illustrations that are given in verse 10. See, I have set thee this day over the nations and over the kingdoms. And so his message, really this is the theme, kind of the theme, major theme of Jeremiah. He says to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So he's going to be talking about a carpenter throwing down or destroying. He's going to talk about a farmer that's rooting out. But he's also going to be talking about a carpenter that builds up and as a farmer that plants. So his judgment is, so his prophecies are of judgment, but also a future hope. And that's a wonderful thing in the theme of this book that he's going to uproot, he's going to plant, he's going to break down, he's going to build. And so we think about all of this, a message of sin and judgment Jeremiah spoke of sin and judgment. He denounced the sins, uh, pointing out repeatedly over and over and over again, Judah, you're an adulterer. Judah, you're an idolater. Judah, you've turned your back on God. And he charged them with turning away from God to idolatry. And because they sinned, God was going to judge them. And so the enemy, Babylon, comes from the north. A dreadful disaster. But as Jeremiah, you can oftentimes, you might see these signs sometimes by some of the people, uh, turn or burn, or all these horrible signs that are very abrasive. Jeremiah's message was, get right with God or judgment is coming. But as he's doing it, he's weeping. Look with me at Jeremiah 8, 18 to 19. Jeremiah's message that he gave was never to a people that you deserve it. I mean, people that didn't like him, they hated him, they despised him, they even sought to kill him. And then in Egypt, they put him in a dungeon. If there's any man's life that would be considered a failure, it would be Jeremiah's life. (laughs) He didn't build any ministry, everyone hated him. Everyone rejected him, and he's thrown into prison. A lonely man. Jeremiah 8.18. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? As you think upon these truths with Jeremiah and just kind of an overview of this book, when was the last time we were heartbroken over the disobedience maybe of a fellow believer, a fellow person that we knew, their life was going into ruin? And I, and I asked that self a question to myself. What effect would God's message really have uh, on judgment, on sin, have on believers? Judgment of sin. We know what the Bible speaks of the end times, it is going to be horrendous. I don't believe we're very far from that. I don't have a timing. I don't know the timing. And I'm not going to give a timing because I don't have a clue. I'm going to leave it to God to deal with that. 
But as I come to the conclusion, this book, yes, I've talked a lot about the destruction. I've talked about Jeremiah's fortitude, Jeremiah's tenacity, Jeremiah's courage, Jeremiah's steadfastness. So in addition to his preaching of a sin and judgment and destruction, he also would prophesy of hope. He knows the nation's going to collapse. He knows the temple's going to be destroyed. The worship in Israel, uh, in Judah, is going to uh, go away. He knows that it, God would abandon his, uh, his people for a time because of their wickedness. And he repeatedly reminds them, as Jeremiah gives, and even though they go into exile, guess what happened? God already planned for their return. Look at me at Jeremiah 29, 11. I am coming to the conclusion here. But Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. In the middle of this, of a horrible scene, verse 11 of Jeremiah 29, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. What does he think? Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Imagine you're one of the captives. You're there in exile in Babylon or in Egypt. And you read that and you say, oh, Lord, I look forward to the day. You know what Judah's ultimate hope was? They, they knew the Messiah was coming. A, desi- a Messiah that would be described as a shepherd, a king, the branch. And they, they also, for, Jeremiah would foretell, and he forgot prophecies of the future. He would institute a new covenant in which a God's law would be written in the heart and the Messiah would bring true righteousness to this sinful nation, true joy to a people in sorrow, and true hope for those who would despair. Uh, the sinful nation would have to endure great pain and judgment, but after the judgment, guess what? God's bringing blessings. If you think about this message, I want you to think, uh, as we look at our nation and we look at some things that are going on that are disturbing, what ought this to do with us? As I, we look at Jeremiah, what Should the impact, as I said, that God says, I hate the idolatry, I hate all of this wickedness, I hate the materialism, I hate all the perversion, I hate all of this. Will you get right? Josiah got right and God held off the judgment. The next few kings that are there, they didn't get right. And my oh my, it was jumping off the cliff into the furnace. And this ought to embolden us, as Jeremiah did, to pray for mercy. To take a bold stand for the Lord. But in God's economy, God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. There's hope. When times are dark, when times seem impossible, when times seem, Lord, I can't go another day. Lord, it's too much. I make it personal. I take the truths of this, and Jeremiah would speak to a people more than 2,500 years ago. There's three principles that we can apply. Number one, pray about genuine righteousness and commitment of believers. Number two, pray about repentance among God's people. Number three, thank God for future hope. If we're a believer, times may get much darker in this country. But despite the worst day here on earth, we have a glorious day in heaven. We have a glorious time that we're going to spend with Christ forever. Here's a prophet during a crisis time. I found it quite appropriate. It definitely encouraged my heart. Looking at these and these truths, you know, this night, this evening, I'd like to encourage you, no matter what you're going through, We need to, first of all, if you do have sin in your life, and maybe everything around you is falling apart, you need to ask God, Lord, is there any sin in my life? If you're a believer, Lord, I need to get right. Maybe things are still comfortable, but the pressure is just building and building and building and building and building. You might want to say, Lord, is there any sin? I'm not saying there is, but I'm just saying you need to ask. Because God did a sparing work on Josiah's reign. If things still get bad and Maybe that stress is coming like Jeremiah, and he he couldn't change the course of the nation, but he could change the course of pleading with God for his people. Sure, he had a message that was unfavorable, but he also had a message of hope. Let's turn to God. You know what? There have been men and women throughout the centuries 
that have stood firm. We know what God's called us to do. We're going to do it no matter what. You know, that ought to be our principle. I'm going to do what God's called me to do. No matter how hard it is, I'm going to do right. I'm going to do right, let the rocks fall, let the world fall apart, but I'm going to stand right with God. And you'll never go wrong. Sure, there'll be hard times. Jeremiah had it. And so tonight, as we come to the time of invitation, if I could have Miss Pat come forward. As we have this time of invitation, I really want to, I hope this was an encouragement to you. You know what? We can go through, as I look at the news, and I have to limit how much I watch in the news because it can definitely discourage me. Uh, social media and other things that have all these sorts of uh, very foreboding and ominous uh, type of policies and other things that are coming down the pipe. And when I can get very discouraged and I can say, Lord, it, it's just not worth it. But I need to stand upon the calling that God's given to me. We need to all stand upon the calling that God's given to us. I'm going to stand for Christ no matter what. And you know what? When we do that, there's a hope and there's a joy and we can have God that will be with us just as God. He'll be a, a fortress, Jeremiah. God will be our fortress. Others may not like us, but let us stand strong in the Lord. As the music plays, I'd encourage you to do business with the Lord.